Um, hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, panel one of our conference uh, um, on um, decolonizing knowledge production entitled Contested Spaces, Epistemic Asymmetries, Mobilities and Identities. Um, I hope you managed to attend uh, um, the welcome and the keynote conversation the, that preceded uh, the panel. Um, and uh, I am now very pleased uh, to welcome our first panel entitled The Colonizing Knowledge Production, Africanizing Knowledge. Um, I will very briefly um, introduce the four speakers um, and then I will pass it on to them because we have quite limited time and so I don't want to take too much time out um, and, um, and we will have also time for the uh, Q&A at the end of the presentations. May I remind you to put your questions in the Q&A box uh, and then we will be we will aim to answer some of them um, in the time that we have. Um, so I will um, the, the first speaker for the panel, uh, Dr. Awina Okech, a reader um, at the SOAS um, Center for Gender Studies. Um, Dr. Okech will um, uh, will present uh, the title of the presentation is Africanizing Knowledge at SOAS: Reflections on the Africa Review. Um, Dr. Okic will be followed uh, by Dr. Monica Otu from the University of KwaZulu Natal, who is going. Is titled, his presentation is entitled "What is good for the world is good for Africa: Africanization of knowledge production in the context of globalization." Um, this will be followed by a presentation entitled The Structure Agency Problem in the Context of the Colonizing Knowledge by Dr. Mira Sarabatnatanam uh, from SOAS University of London. Um, and finally, um, we will have a presentation by uh, Professor Paulus Zulu from the University of KwaZulu Natal whose presentation is entitled Decolonization and Africanization of Knowledge, Political or Ideological Concepts. Um, without further ado, I will now uh, like to pass on to Dr. Awino Okej uh, to start her presentation. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angelica. And of course, uh, great congratulations to the team at SOAS and UKZN that have pulled off this collaboration. It's really a pleasure to be here today. So I have 10 minutes. Let me set off my timer and then offer you what my reflections are for today. So this talk that I'm giving today is based on a forthcoming paper, which is a collaboration between a colleague and I on how to think about internationalization in UK universities using the prism of critiques on African studies. Now the UK universities I'm referencing here are SOAS, where I teach, and King's College London. Um, and the frame for the work is the Africa Review process that was co-chaired by Professor Badarin and I in 2020, which was geared at examining how SOAS approached Africa from both a teaching, research, and partnerships perspective. Internationalization as a framework that anchors this paper is informed by my colleague's work, Professor Loni Shakin at King's College London, who as Vice Principal International is thinking uh, about how to reorganize or rethink dominant internationalization approaches so that the ways in which the university that she works um, for and in approaches internationalization in a manner that's fit for purpose and that's responsive to a changing global environment. The core argument in the paper, which is not necessarily what I will uh, elaborate to any depth in this uh, talk uh, this morning, is around an argument for an expanded framework for understanding internationalization in higher education and analyzing its role, particularly in relation to the delivery of inclusive education to a more diverse body of students. And you will hear aspects of this today. What we ask is how a new internationalization framework might transform teaching programs as well as the student experience. So this presentation in a short while is going to set out the key axis for internationalization that we are interrogating. And then I will retreat to looking at the debates on Africa at SOAS and the opportunities for rethinking internationalization that lie within how we grapple with what students and staff were telling us in relation to teaching on Africa at SOAS. Now, there are three key dimensions of internationalization that we have focused on in the paper and which therefore framed the presentation today. The first dimension is the role of education as driving social change in a global context through a change in outlook and society. And really, it's the idea that when students come to our universities, when we engage in research, 
what is this broader global change strategy that this teaching and research is geared towards. Uh, and ideally that our teaching and research is around fostering global consciousness. And therefore this should be seen as part of the mission, vision and values of, the, of, of any university. Uh, the second dimension of internationalization is connected to this idea of mobility, right? The movement of students and academic staff. Now, more often than not, internationalization strategies have often focused on outward mobility, and this has become embedded in policy and practice across academic institutions. And here, of course, you're talking about your study abroad programs, visiting and joint academic appointments have become more commonplace. But what has rarely been addressed is how these international, this dimension of internationalization takes into account the needs or concerns of non-mobile home students, as well as non-mobile international students. In essence, an interrogation of the class dynamics, as well as the racialized dynamics that shapes who goes out and who comes in and benefits from this dimension of internationalization. The third and final dimension of internationalization that we concern ourselves with is to the extent uh, uh, to which internationalization is integrated into the overall university strategy and much more specifically into its education strategies. So here the focus is on curriculum design, course development, and that internationalization should become part and parcel of this at all levels. The core argument here, of course, is that classrooms have become much more diverse, and while the substance of teaching and learning and research has largely remained unchanged. Now I want to emphasize here that often when people hear the word internationalization, the assumption is that we are talking about or catering to international students coming uh, to, to universities, for instance, in the global north. Uh, but, the, but at the heart of it is around the question of global consciousness. So wherever it is that you're located in, in whatever part of the world in the university, how global is the curriculum, how comprehensive, how robust is it in relation to how students, whether they're home students or international uh, uh, students are experiencing or expanding their knowledge of the world. And again, underlying this idea of um, changing the substance of teaching and learning is around de-emphasizing, of course, the Western canon as part of teaching and learning, foregrounding diverse sets of knowledges from different parts of the world, not for their regional specificities, but for how those regional dynamics shape and influence our understanding of global concerns. Now, why did we focus on area studies? So why, why, why did it seem like it would be a good idea to do a collaboration that talked about internationalization strategy and to, to think about area studies as a space from which to, to rethink what global consciousness means or to rethink what student experience and a diverse curriculum or a, or a global holistic curriculum looks like? Now, I think most of us who are listening today will know that area studies generally and African studies in particular have had their origins outside of the context that are being studied. African studies, for instance, in the US emerges in the context of the Cold War period and was therefore very deeply imbricated in the explosive uh, conversations around racial politics and imperialism. And somebody like Zeleza has written quite extensively about this. The university in which I teach has the unique history in Britain for being the first university to teach African history. And this was shortly after the Second World War period in which the, the British government was seeking to define its place and its changing interests after the Second World War. African studies, therefore, as we all know, is often framed by, the, by its role uh, in the history of colonization. And rethinking African studies there that many before me have already made, right? And this is the fact that all knowledge accumulated throughout the centuries on different aspects of, of, of Africa should be shared with people of the African continent. And one can think about this in relation to artifacts and knowledges sitting in archives in Paris, in London, in Lisbon, you know, uh, our, our heritage that's seated in spaces far off than the continent from which they originated and owned by um, the, you know, imperial powers, if you will. The second is that adequate measures must be taken to facilitate a critical reappropriation of the very process of knowledge production. Again, one can frame this as part of the larger debates, you know, that have happened across the African continent since the 1960s, framed through Africanization of knowledge, academic freedom, and much more recently uh, in the 2015-16 period through the Fismas Fall protests in South Africa specifically. 
but there's a larger and longer trajectory of these conversations around Africanizing and decolonizing knowledge that has happened in various parts of the African continent. And again, you know, somebody like Mamdani has written quite recently about this history and narratives and folks like Paul Zeleza as well. The third and central uh, element on rethinking African studies, of course, is around acknowledging the power asymmetries in the production and the consumption of African knowledge. In essence, how do we think about knowledge on Africa? How do we think about knowledge by Africans as part of this enterprise of both uh, disrupting what, what we consume as African studies? Do we even need to be talking about African studies? Or do we need to be talking about knowledges on Africa, knowledges by Africans that are responding to global challenges and that are framing global debates um, on various issues? So that we avoid this, this kind of nativization of what knowledge is from various reg regions. It might be Africa, it might be the Middle East. Um, that are framed as so specific to those regions, while knowledges from elsewhere somehow have a much more global appeal and global relevance. So where does SOAS come into this conversation? As I've already alluded to before, we have this unique history of being a university that was the first to set up uh, a space within which to understand uh, regions that uh, the British government was had an interest in. That interest, of course, we know is as colonialism. Um, we, as a result of that history, our, our, our big brand has always been that we remain one of the universities in the UK that offers a, a, as a center of African knowledge, if you will. Now we have a range of, of modules uh, on Africa, both at undergraduate and postgraduate level, unique in our teaching on African languages, as well as cross-cultural studies that sit in different de departments. Again, the university has also developed a brand, an externally facing brand, as a pioneer and leader in decolonization. Part, part of that is, of course, around uh, uh, trying to reorganize the way in which SOAS thinks about regions uh, that were set up to serve a particular colonial purpose and how you make that fit for purpose in a world that is changing. Now, the Africa Review, therefore, is triggered by a, a moment where we are doing all of this work externally around decolonization. We believe that uh, the institution has done quite a lot to reorganize the ways in which teaching on Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, which are the focus regions of the university, has occurred over time. But students tell us actually very little has changed in the majority of the programs and the modules that they experience, and that they're still remains a heavy focus on the Western canon. There still remains a sort of uh, racist, if you will, approach to thinking about or understanding regions of the African continent. And much more importantly, the absence of, of African voices, scholarship, and points of view within the very syllabi that they're experiencing. So in essence, uh, a lack of coherence between this brand around decolonization and their experience in the classroom. So part of our work was trying to figure out, part of our work here, I'm referring to the Africa Review, was trying to figure out how do we develop an approach that seeks to resolve this conundrum that the university found, found itself in. And here in closing, I want to offer the, the sets of conclusions we arrived at. My 10 minutes is already up. The first was the importance of recognizing that at an institutional level, those need to build a shared vision of decolonizing. Inclusivity is very separate from decolonizing, of course. So decolonizing, inclusivity, and interdisciplinarity, particularly in relation to teaching and understanding Africa. The second was the need for a much more expansive reading of Africa that was not just about the continent Africa, but Africa in, its, in relation to its diaspora. The third was around reducing and trying to blur the disciplinary silos, which then led to situations where people experienced, had very different experiences of teaching Africa or understanding uh, issues around the African continent across the university. So you had some sort of perhaps radical, um, useful uh, ways of framing the African continent, understanding the African continent in a section of the university, but very little may have changed in other parts of the university. So what therefore, did the opportunity for interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary work have to challenging colleagues to think differently about their teaching uh, and research, but also to create the opportunities for peer learning across by academics and by students who are experiencing Africa, not in, in, in clusters around culture, languages, politics, history, but around a range of transdisciplinary conversations based on the global challenges that understanding Africa could offer to explaining and interrogating those global challenges. 
part of the suggestions that came from students was the need to rethink a program, uh, a degree program uh, that was uh, temporarily named Africa and the Africa Diaspora Degree Program that did a couple of interesting things. The first was to see the opportunity of the program uh, as a chance to expand the, the sort of um, foot, foot traffic, if you will, of African and Black diaspora academics from various parts of, of the African continent and the Black diasporic world. Meaning, therefore, that you re relieved the pressure of one university providing extensive expertise on a continent that's large, on a range of political questions that are quite diverse, and instead tapped into wider networks and teaching and joint collaborative opportunities as part of delivering this new vision of what Africa and African diaspora studies looks like. That again connects to the point around internationalization, which is around outward mobility, inward mobility, and dealing with the opportunities of blended learning to address class questions, to address racialized communities that are often written out of these programs. I'm going to stop here so that I allow Monica to come in and I will raise some of my final points uh, during the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, greetings, everyone. Uh, this is Monica from the University of Pazulu Natal. The title of my presentation is What is Good for, for the World is Good for Africa? Africanization of Knowledge Production in the Context of Globalization. Uh, before I begin my presentation, I would like to bring to the attention of the audience that I'll be using the concepts of uh, Africanization and decolonization interchangeably at least for the sake of this presentation. Thank you. Um, I will be sharing Sorry about this. The computer is giving me attitude now. It's holding. Sorry. I saw the this attitude. Oh, seem to be experiencing a problem with my laptop. Just give me a few Perhaps seconds. Perhaps go without the slideshow, Monica, without the slide. All right, uh, okay. Thank you. Um, my topic again is what is good for the world is good for Africa, Africanization of knowledge production in the context of globalization. Like I said, uh, before I begin my presentation, I want to draw to your attention that I'll be using the concepts decolonization and Africanization interchangeably for the sake of this uh, presentation. So, um, my, my presentation is centered around four key questions. Four quick key questions. I didn't write this down. Okay, my presentation is centered around four key questions. Uh, these are, what is the discourse all about? This is about to examine the nexus between uh, globalization and Africanization or decolonization. Why is this important to Africa in the context of knowledge production? How is the African scholarship responding to this discourse? What does the decolonial discourse offer? Global, globalization remains a contested area among Southern economies uh, because, uh, because of the obvious reason of uh, asymmetrical power relationships that exist between the North and the South. And again, because most of the narratives around globalization has been theorized from Northern perspectives which of course indicates a perpetuation of the colonial difference as we see uh, 
as explained by Escobar, that most Northern theorists seem unwilling to consider that it is impossible to think about transcending or overcoming modernity without approaching it uh, from the perspective of colonial difference. This form of theorization has produced counter discourses from which scholars of the global South are fighting against the Northern epistemological uh, hegemony. Prominent among these counter discourses is the decolonial term scholarship, which aims to deal with the unreservable, uh, which aims to deal with the unreservable debates around the three, three central dualities coined by Cornell 2007 of global local, homogeneity and difference, dispersed and concentrated powers, uh, which also gels with the works that were dealt with Zeleza and his colleagues on a, in a book titled African Universities in the 21st Centuries, where 21st century, where they stress the emergence of the new knowledge economy that yields to issues of access, quality, equity, access, quality, equity, authority, accountability, diversification and differentiation, internationalization and indigenization, representation and responsibility, global visibility and local anchorage. Uh, because we are living in a globalizing world that we are interconnected. Now, the next the question is, what is good? What is good about globalization? Uh, we realize that the world we are living in right now, political identities have transcended historical, historical trajectory uh, to include current practices through which identities are now defined. And scholars, especially those from the global south, are uh, involved in undoing this Eurocentric uh, totalizing claim uh, to unsettle these uh, claims as being um, the singular authoritativeness of universal character typically assumed and portrayed in academic thought. Globalization can change the content of our, of our theorizing. as explained by Richard Twain, 2014. Globalization has a potential of, to respond to an agenda of global thinking that transcends the north-south local global subject object binaries in favor of plural universality and interversality in the construction of knowledge. The next slide we'll be looking at the why. African, the African academy is relevant part of the global economy and globalization has become the standard through which our academic uh, vibrancy and vitality is measured uh, to inform knowledge production and dissemination. Internationalization of the African academy has compelled many institutions on the continent to embrace global standards that celebrate productivity and excellence. The emergence of interdisciplinary configurations and research agendas meet the rapid globalizing and technological innovations. Uh, the knowledge economy is central also to nation building and national development. The academy is where potentials are unleashed, skills nurtured and communicated to the outside world for development and progress of society and humanity. So um, skimming and scanning through the literature on globalization and Africanization, three streams of thoughts were identified. Uh, these are the idealists, the moderates, and the extremists. 
The idealist engagement with the issue of globalization uh, from an African perspective, they believe that uh, uh, African, for African scholarship to enter the scientific fraternity, knowledge fraternity, um, they have to approach it through Afrocentric knowledge paradigms. The nerd rates are caught between the idealist and the extremist. And here, uh, they embrace the idea of thinking global and acting local which lends to the discourse of localization and indigenization of global knowledge systems. The extremists are of the position that globalization is not healthy for Africa because they are totally opposed to the project of globalization because they believe that globalization has, is a desperate attempt to deprive an African of his or her natural cultural Africanness. My concluding remarks are based on the common futures that we, we are aiming at crafting for the 21st century and beyond. For, in order for us to, to craft a common future of inclusivity that does not discriminate against other uh, knowledge systems, we have to disarticulate orthodox epistemologies in favor of indigenized articulations that reflect the African experience. We also have to look for what works for Africa with a global outlook, finding convergence zones of onto epistemological mix to inform global thinking for vibrant scholarship and development of our society and the world at large. We have to start engaging with meta theory to cater for contextual and pluralistic approaches while attempting to globalize local experiences. And with this in mind, we, 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 we aim at looking at uh, in, uh, in pluriversality and interversality to allow cultures to communicate with each other that we may have a global response to issues and then address them from multiple social realities. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. We now uh, move um, to the next presenter, Mira Sabratamnam. Mira, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll just ask Monica um, to stop sharing her screen, if that's all right. Thank you, wonderful. Um, it's lovely to be here. Thank you all very much um, for coming along and for sparing some time in uh, on your Thursday. And it's just an absolute delight um, to uh, be here together in whatever part of the world we are. Um, of course, facilitated by internet access. And uh, I'm conscious here that uh, as I talk to you, it's, it's easier to talk to some of you who are thousands of miles away than it is to speak to some of my students who don't have um, high quality, uh, you know, internet connections at home and the rest of it. So when we think about the rearrangement or the reconfiguration of our spaces, um, clearly in the future, broadband democracy is going to be one of those issues that um, comes up. So anyway, my talk today is called the uh, structure agency problem in the context of decolonizing knowledge. And like Awino, I'm going to start my uh, stopwatch so I don't uh, colonize your time too much. Uh, so um, why is this question being asked? Actually, this um, question emerged as part of thinking about my teaching. I teach on a third year undergraduate course here called Decolonizing World Politics. And in many ways, the talk today is actually a reflection on some of the themes that have come out through the discussions with my students. And in that sense, it's sort of, it's dedicated to them as um, my, my interlocutors and co-thinkers. So what is the structure agency problem and why have I brought it up now? Um, so this actually comes from my own undergraduate studies a long, long time ago, and I haven't thought about the structure agency problem for a long time. 
But in sociological theory, um, the structure agency problem is understood as a way of thinking about where agency comes from and the extent to which human action is determined by the social structures around them, by their cultures, by their languages, by the material organization of the world, and all the possibilities for creativity, for freedom, for change, for moral responsibility uh, in terms of determining the outcomes. And crudely speaking, in the Western tradition, um, liberals have been understood as emphasizing individual agency and rationality, and structuralists, Marxists, and other kinds of structuralists have been understood as emphasizing the role of social structures. And the way that this debate has unfolded and probably where it's at now in um, a lot of the Western kind of spaces is some version of structuration theory that's a sort of way of trying to understand um, agency as structured but not determined by the resources uh, on which it draws. So in terms of how that works in a decolonial theory, um, I would argue that actually prior to this debate kind of happening in the Western Academy, it was a central concern of anti-colonial thought. If you look at uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and his conception of how um, black agency comes about, and even though it's within the context of a very oppressive structure, uh, African-Americans could play a central role in uh, the civil war and in resisting uh, racism. And in this sense, Du Bois is uh, part of a broad tradition, which is pan-Africanist, which is anti-racist, which is decolonial, in thinking about what are the possibilities for agency under highly oppressive, highly violent uh, structures. And importantly, I think they concluded that, of course, agency was possible, but it would have to draw on resources other than those provided by those structures. To cut forward to a influential account of structure and agency under colonial um, uh, conditions, Franz Fanon is the obvious uh, reference point and he has been highly influential and he continues to be highly influential and highly referenced uh, within debates. But this is interesting because his answer to the structure agency problem is actually quite a stark one and it's one which I think um, is, is in some respects the most radical. Uh, for Fanon, it starts with the structure. The colonial structure is absolutely violent. And in that sense, um, it is visited on the body of the native. It is embodied in the responses of the native to colonialism. And that uh, violence is therefore both necessary and inevitable as a way of resisting that structure, okay? So this violence of the colonial order impels this violence response. And this is the condition for the rebirth or for decolonization. And so Fanon's world of structure and agency in, in some sense is very stark. There is violence in the structure, there must be violence in the agency. If we look at more recently influential uh, writings, we come to the concept of the coloniality of power, which has some inheritances from the Fanonian tradition. Um, the coloniality of power is a concept obviously developed um, in Latin American uh, context by thinkers such as Anibal, Anibal Quijano, uh, but has also become uh, influential in uh, other debates. And I'm thinking, of course, of uh, Sabello and Glover Gatschini's work on uh, coloniality in Africa. Now, the coloniality of power concept is a structural concept, right? It's fundamentally an account of how modern world order is structured by relations of coloniality and that this deeply saturates our conceptions of gender, our conceptions of authority, of course, of the economy and of subjectivity. And for the most pessimistic accounts, and I would include Nglova Gatschini within this, the um, effect has been a total colonization and a continued colonization of the minds and the economies and the ways of being or in Africa and elsewhere. And the metaphor here again is a very stark one. It's like, um, it's like uh, Fanon, it's a very kind of total conception. Uh, in uh, Ndlovigat Shaney's metaphor, it's a snare or it's a cage that um, uh, the colonized live in. So what is the vision of liberation here? Of course, for Fanon, it's the sort of violent overthrow of the system. Um, in the coloniality of power literature, it's about indigenous thought. And we've heard um, some arguments here for the need to recover and recapture indigenous thought as a means of opposing Eurocentric thought. And this is important, uh, but it begs the question, where do these resources come from if the structure of coloniality is so total, right? If it is constitutive, if it is hegemonic, if it totally colonizes 
our minds, it empties our brains, then where is it possible for agency or liberation uh, to come from? So one might argue that, uh, as many of the Latin American schools have done so, that it's indigenous thought, and they're talking here about the indigenous peoples of the Americas, it's indigenous thought that provides a way of uh, counteracting, if you like, Eurocentric and colonial uh, modern knowledges. Uh, and in part of doing this, then a, a delinking exercise is advocated in terms of how one goes forward. However, I would say that for feminists in particular, this solution has never been wholly adequate. Um, why? Because uh, feminists, particularly third world feminists, African feminism, uh, feminism in the global south, has been dealing with the multiple intersecting forms of uh, domination that include coloniality, that include patriarchy, which include capitalism and so on. So I would argue that the authenticity of the idea is not enough to forge a pathway for liberation. Um, and that for most feminist thought, and here I'm generalizing somewhat, but um, and I look forward to discussing this maybe, for most feminist thought, the issue is not simply the origins of the idea, but its usage, right? If you are being beaten by your husband, it doesn't matter whether the ideology behind it in some respects is a European ideology or, uh, or an indigenous one. What I want to suggest is that feminist thinkers um, from the global south have actually got a conception of liberation or a, or a understanding of the structure agency debate, which could be more productive for thinking about how we decolonize uh, knowledge. And this is because the emphasis is not so much on a, um, a zero sum game, if you like, between structure and agency. And it, the emphasis is not on agency as the ability to commit um, master acts of mastery and acts of, of violence, but instead it's about recreating the relations that we engage in, about cultivating alternatives and about transformative action. That transformative action is not this kind of total delinking, although it may involve acts like that, um, but it's about, in my view, emphasizing um, a dynamic and a direction of travel that uses the resources around it and deploys them in a liberatory uh, kind of direction. And just picking up on what Professor Mbembe was saying in the keynote about new planetary consciousness, I was thinking about um, the uh, work of Dr. Vangari, uh, Professor Wangari Mutai and the Greenbelt movement as a better model potentially of um, radical action than the models of the Haitian Revolution or so on, which are often referenced in the, um, in the coloniality of power literature. So if we think about the world work of the Green Belt movement, this is a group of women who are going out to plant trees in defiance of the local state and, um, and in terms of international capital, uh, planting trees to reclaim the landscape, to remake uh, their environment. And so this is about the kind of literal transformation of the conditions. Does it matter if planting trees is a um, European practice? Of course, Europeans plant trees uh, and they do so in ways which can uh, take forward, if you like, the capitalist extractive relations with nature. Uh, the, Ethiopian, the Ethiopian government plants trees, but in such a way which doesn't necessarily mean that it's not engaged in other kinds of colonial practice. So it's not so much the idea itself that needs to be indigenous, but of course, um, the Green Belt movement was informed by indigenous conceptions of uh, conservation. But it's the fact of doing a transformative action which transforms the relationship between the communities and the environment and the state, uh, which confronts the disposability and the degradation and the depredation, uh, the de depredation of the environment. I would argue that by emphasizing the authenticity of the practice to the place uh, against, if you like, the imported models of development and well-being, um, that this represents a way of thinking about decolonization in the contemporary age. Um, and it's one which is a more practical and in some respects more radical account than the um, account that we get from um, Fanon and maybe through the coloniality of power, some of the literature. Now I'm slightly op making oppositions where maybe uh, there's more compatibility for the sake of the argument. Um, but just to conclude um, what I'm saying, I suppose what I'm saying is what coloniality can be understood as is not necessarily just a mental cage or a snare that we have to escape and delink from, um, because that leads us to a very pessimistic view of what's possible and may even lead to resignation. Um, 
but instead decolonization understood as a practical activity in a colonial landscape that seeks to be transformative um, helps us set forth not the new man of Fanon, which is kind of free of his colonial shackles, uh, but a new person who has recalibrated the relationship and the new and a new community, which has new, recalibrated the relationship between the structure and the persons within it, and which has transformed um, the space. This is less, in some respects, spectacular and less violent than um, revolution, but it is revolutionary and it does, in some respects, challenge coloniality at its root. So I'll stop there and um, hope to engage with you in the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mira. Um, very inspiring um, contribution. I will now pass it on to Professor Polo Zulu. Um, we can see you. Uh, welcome. And uh, please, you can start your 10 minutes contribution. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yeah, we can hear you and we can see you. Thank you. Great. Uh, in this paper, I'm arguing that decolonization and Africanization seem to be contradictory concepts, particularly if one considers the broader, wider meaning of decolonization, as a Chilean member did say this morning. Apparently, we are using a very narrow sense. And I refer particularly to the process movements, Root Must Fall, as others. And I find that contested spaces, epistemic asymmetries, mobilities and identities, as the title of this conference is, best locate decolonization and Africanization within the domain of politics rather than the domain of academia. A more appropriate conceptualization would be internationalization, advancing Africa's contribution to the global movement for change in the curricula. I'm concentrating on the cur curriculum in particular because I think conceived in the narrow sense that we do decolonization and the curriculum would pro oh, decolonization of the curriculum would present unforeseen problems, probably obfuscating rather than enlightening. The curriculum generally serves a number of purposes, three in particular. One, generation of knowledge. Two, instrumental, where the curriculum prepares individuals for entry into the market space, the qualifications. And thirdly, problem solving. Now, with re regard to the second in particular, even the first would be very problematic, but let's concentrate on the second. I cannot conceive of a scientist or an accountant or a medical for that matter, trained within a specific geolocalized curriculum in the international world. This has been much clearer in South Africa where trying the narrow sense probably has not demonstrated much. I'm taking, for instance, here examples in the attempt to collaborate with indigenous healers in the treatment of HIV and AIDS. And we are now probably 20, 25 or more years in that up to now, the dominant form of treating HIV and AIDS is antiviral treatment. And the little indigenous herbs have been of no help whatsoever. To me, therefore, issues of decolonizing the curriculum appeal more to the political and to the populist 
rather than being real. I am here saying, if we want to move, to move forward, we have to be honest within ourselves as well. Uh, Africanization and indigenization have been used interchangeably. I do not negate the role of local knowledge, local experience, but I do not think that we can accentuate that against international and global experiences. We'll probably find ourselves lagging behind a lot. Now I'm trying to draw parallels with what happened in politics. Up to now, from the 1960s, call it, African political systems spoke of decolonization. But as we all know, none challenged the colonial boundaries. None, the citizenship is along colonial lines drawn by the colonial boundaries. So I do not understand how one would have spoken of decolonization in politics, while at the same time maintaining the infrastructure as it was. So what I am saying in short in this paper is that at times we use emotive language in order to appeal to the public. And in the process, run the risk of throwing out the baby with the bad water. Because in the mind of the ordinary people, the use of such terms in the narrow sense negates progress. As a Chilean member said this morning, a chauvinistic localized approach to the solution of the world's problems. In my words, it's not decolonization. So we have to be very careful in what we do. There is no denial that Africa has made serious contributions to the development of knowledge, even of technology. And I do not see why we are shy to say that instead of being all the time defensive and projecting ourselves as victims of circumstance, particularly victims of colonialization. Every nation in the world has been colonized. They grafted what was there from the colonial system built in the new that they themselves developed and produced the new. I have not heard of an African, of an Asianized curriculum. I think this is very pertinent because the more narrowly we want to develop, the more we harm ourselves then open ourselves to global influences and forces. If we see them in the negative sense, we're not going to assimilate and use them as positively as we should in order to develop. That is the point. If you come to the curriculum per se, as a curriculum, there are aspects of the curriculum that are neutral and not at all subject to normative interpretations and normative sources. For instance, to be precise, I can see how you can Africanize mathematics, Africanize biology, Africanize accounting, account, Africanize uh, physical science, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, COVID-19 has probably put some sanity, particularly to countries like South Africa, 
where one sees the role of science as science being enhanced rather than a narrow conception and a, a political interpretation of what science means. Uh, in short, what I want to say is that both Africanization and decolonization in the narrow sense of the concept is wisely and particularly used in the protest settles are emotive populist concepts rather than logical academic formulations. While there is no denying the psychological damage that colonization inflicted intellectually on the indigenous populations through undermining indigenous, indigenous practices, equally, there is no denying that Africans has to, have to engage with the past and rectify needs and fallacies by demonstrating through research and scholarship that Africa has substance and that she can equally contribute to the global knowledge system as anyone else. However, the claim that anyone can decolonize or Africanize an educational system while keeping both its framework and structure is fallacious. While this might appeal to sentiment, practically, it is unimaginable. One has to, one has not had, as I say, Asianizing the curriculum, despite a good number of Asian countries having their own characters, such as the Chinese and Japanese characters and alphabet, et cetera, et cetera. Where we aspire to create, we probably need a different terminology, lest we engage in a humpty dumpty semantic game. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Zulu. Um, brilliant presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I will now pass it on back to Awino Okech, who is going to um, take the, the question from the Q&A box. Many thanks, Awino. Absolutely. So colleagues, uh, colleagues who are on the panel, I'm sure you've been tracking the questions on the Q&A, so I'm not really going to play role of moderator. And so maybe what I'll do is mirror the couple of questions for you. Have you had a minute to look at them? So maybe we can just start off with you if you had some quick responses. Yeah. Um, sure. I mean, I'll start with um, Elaine's question, uh, which is about the implications of a recalibrated relationship of structure and agency for educational engagements um, in higher education. So I think um, part of this has already um, been articulated in some of the critical pedagogy literature, um, and it emphasizes, I suppose, two things. So one is um, giving students the tools that they need to approach their world um, in a way which uh, empowers them, but also helps them kind of um, collaborate. And so the importance of teaching critical thought and being able to teach thought that allows the critique of hegemonic forms of uh, knowledge. Um, and then the second thing is about educational practices themselves as being um, meaningfully, um, not just prefigurative, but themselves part of the rehumanizing process, if you like. And so um, engaging in pedagogy, which teaches how we can relate to each other in a way that doesn't involve sort of domination and speaking over in educating, uh, in creating an educational environment that um, prioritizes collaboration rather than um, individual kind of competition. Um, in a way which prioritizes ethical engagement, prioritizes listening. Um, some of us are starting to do some of these experiments in our classrooms. Um, of course, the wider system is one in which it wants us to rank and sort students as individuals rather than as, um, as humans, if you like, or as, as people embedded in relationships engaged in collective projects. And so some of the um, experiments that I think are worth pursuing in this respect are ones which teach students the ethics of decolonial practice as well as the critical thinking that they need to challenge the world around them, but also themselves, right? And so um, we all sort of absorb little stereotypes or shibboleths as we move through the academy. And I think we need the capacity to critique those as well. Thanks, Alina. Um, 
Did you want me to uh, pick up one of the other ones? Uh, maybe you can pick up on one more. There's one here in relation to how COVID-19 might shift conversations around the coloniality of power. Are you seeing that one? Yes, I do. Thank you. No, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think as was mentioned in the keynote this morning, um, the coloniality of power does certainly give us purchase on the uh, spread and the um, uh, response to COVID-19. It gives us a purchase on, if you like, the um, radical um, exploitation of nature and the uh, industrialization of food production that uh, led to the conditions in which the COVID uh, disease could um, emerge. Um, and spread around the world, as well as the differentiated vulnerabilities that different populations have to the disease. And so we see already that um, the death rates of COVID-19 very closely mirror um, situations of um, economic and racialized privilege, both north-south and within the global north. That said, um, it's also true that the COVID pandemic reveals new kinds of vulnerabilities that we have not already uh, considered. Um, vulnerabilities around interconnectedness, vulnerabilities around, um, let's say, the bearing of risk and um, so on. And so I think we need to be mindful that what constituted coloniality in the past is not necessarily the kind of framework that best mirrors let's say the structure of vulnerabilities and disposability uh, today. Thank you very much. So Prof, this is this is not from the chat. This is actually from me, Professor Zulu. You know, I think that part of the arguments that folks who talk about decolonizing knowledge make is not around the localization of knowledge per se, but an acknowledgement around the histories of of disciplines, for instance. So no one is 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 arguing that um, the colonizing biology looks like a specific thing, but it's around the erasure of knowledges around some of the ways in which those disciplines have developed that people are calling for uh, recentering. Um, so when somebody talks about business or commerce and you're saying, how can you decolonize that? Perhaps it's about people saying, can we recenter and acknowledge um, you know, different forms of knowledge production processes that exist in, in, in certain contexts that have been stolen, you know, as a result of globalization or the ways in which, you know, global capital works. So I, 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 want, I want to push you a little bit to expand on this idea because you might be taking us back on some, some frontiers that we might have uh, passed um, with, with colleagues in particular fields, given the erasures of knowledge that we have seen in very many fields, um, based on the argument that you can't decolonize biology, you can't decolonize physics, what are you talking about? And then when people unearth a whole range of histories that uh, have been silenced or ignored, then people say, ah, oh, so that's what you mean. I agree, I, I agree with you entirely, but this is not how we use the concepts in everyday language. And this is not how we also respond in everyday language. Uh, what, that's why I made a distinction between a narrow interpretation and a broad interpretation of decolonization. If, for instance, we use a broad interpretation of decolonization, and we even look at the COVID situation as it is now, and we look at governments uh, across the world, to say who has, if colonization means the subjugation, in a sense, of any species of humanity by another species of humanity, then you are perfectly correct. But this is not what, how we are using the terms colonization and decolonization. We seem to be attaching the structures of power to the Berlin conference of 1984 in the African sense to start with. And the people therefore do not understand decolonization in the case of freeing human species from domination by other human species. Rather, they still keep on. And when they talk about Africanization again, they, they sort of think we, we can go back and produce an African curriculum 
we can make an African contribution to the broader cur curriculum, but we cannot produce an African curriculum because it would not be able to exist in a global uh, situation. This is what I am saying, that we have to be very careful and in, even in the way we write. And if we are going to do that, we probably need also to change the terminology. And that's why I was talking about the internationalization and globalization and the contribution of Africa into this context instead of the Africanization because Africanization is definitely a chauvinistic concept. The whole issue of indigenization and glorifying the past as if it had no faults probably perpetuates the practices in another form. That's what I meant. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification, which I hope has also clarified a lot for those in the audience. There's a question here around uh, which I'd like you to also help us clarify. I have some views on it, but it's directed at you. That most of the debates about decolonization and Africanization come from folks in the West. Can you speak to the role of indigenous African-based scholars and researchers in decolonization, in the decolonization agenda? Decolonization here is in quotes. That's for you, Prof. For me? Mm. <laughs> well, there's been a great contribution of by Africans into, I, I probably stick to the fields that I know, mm. although through reading also, uh, as I did say, starting from the Great Wall of Mali to the University of Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. Africa has always had a road. I glanced a few days ago into what they called the top 10 African inventors. And I, I, I was shocked uh, to see the amount of contribution that Afro-Americans and even Africans, I mean, there's the Bill Gates of Africa, mm -hmm. who I quote, at the end of my paper, when you do see the paper in the final instance, who has, in a sense, rev revolutionized uh, computer IT. It's not a world that I'm very familiar with. But in the field of uh, philosophy and political science in particular, I mean, you have African giants like Professor Wiredu, in philosophy, we have African giants like uh, Pauline Hotonji in philosophy. Uh, we really have contemporary giants like Achille Mbembe. Uh, if you listened to his uh, presentation this morning, I mean, it, it was astounding uh, to use uh, one word. Yes, there's been a lot of contribution by African scholars. And that's why I am saying, why are we always taking a defensive approach to these subjects? Because the more we bemoan the past and project ourselves or portray ourselves as victims of something, we are not going to progress much further. It's very easy to go back and mourn. To move forward, it's a difficult process. And I'm saying, can we conjure up terminology that is going to make us go forward? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Angelica, I don't know how much time we have left, but I just wanted to make two quick comments. The first uh, is that I, I think there's a tendency, a false tendency, and I say this as a, as a newcomer to the West, to uh, assume that all of these conversations about Africanization, decolonizing knowledge, rethinking universities, you know, engendering universities, critical approaches to knowledge on the African continent are rooted in diaspora and scholars or Africans located in the diaspora. And I think that we do a great injustice to our colleagues who started these conversations in the 60s across various universities in the African continent. So, uh, there's somebody who asked this question in the chat. I just want to say this is not a diasporan conversation. This is not a conversation that's starting with Africans outside the continent. It has been very rooted 
in, 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 on the continent and with African scholars. Um, I, I always refer people to Paul Zelez's work because I think he does an amazing historical overview around the conversations in academic freedom and uh, rethinking universities across uh, different moments, historical moments on, on the African continent. So I would urge us to look at that as a primary text and much more recently, uh, given COVID-19 dynamics, has done quite a number of video interviews. So if reading is not your thing, there are a number of interviews he's done on um, extensive interviews that he has done on YouTube. The second thing as well is that I believe there has been an, an immense evolution. And I know that I might only be speaking with a better knowledge of the East African region and sections of, uh, of Southern Africa. But I think the evolution in curriculum, because somebody is asking a question in the chat about primary school and secondary school education, there's been a significant evolution. I, I, all of my studies were based on the African continent. And I remember, you know, studying curriculum that was, was telling me about, you know, the first person to discover Lake Victoria being, you know, uh, you know, some chap, some white explorer, and that the people who are in school right now are not studying that. So I think there also has to be an acknowledgement around the energies that have gone towards curriculum reform across the African continent. And if there are certain parts of the African continent where that has not happened, I think we should, we should avoid a sort of this widespread brush that um, our curriculum still portrays this kind of erasures of knowledge, which is what I'm always much more concerned with. Because when you talk about the first person to discover Moise Satunya, which we popularly know as Big Falls, it's around the assumption that, you know, there were no local people who were interacting with those big, what we know as Big Falls today for the longest time. So you really underscore lots of African scholarship lots of African engagement, intellectual, public <laughs> intellectual engagements from the African continent. This is not a diasporic conversation. This is not a, a conversation that's happening from without the African context. And I think perhaps the invitation that that question is making for us is around the, the need to make public, you know, to have an archive somewhere that makes public this, these contributions. Uh, so that we do not see ourselves as what Prof is saying, as, as, uh, as folks who are intervening into an environment in which we were never there. We have always been part of these global conversations. We have shaped these global conversations. Um, and it's around encouraging, particularly those in global northern, you know, universities in the global north, to see studies on Africa, to see knowledge on Africa as shaping the canon, as influencing the canon, rather than something you add as flavor, as, you know, salt and pepper, you know, as part of your curriculum teaching. Uh, Angelica, give me a sense of time so that I see uh, how many more questions to take. Um, yes, I'll give you 10 more minutes. Uh, we can go five minutes over the, the set time. So yes, you've got 10 minutes left. Okay, so maybe what I can invite uh, the panelists to do because I do not see any more questions. Maybe I'll answer one more question that was directed to me, then invite the panelists to just offer their final reflecting thoughts. So there was a question that was asked around the, you know, at, at SOAS, what, what, what students mean or what do they feel? What's the feeling of decolonization for them when they invoke this word? And, and for me, how I've understood it has been in three main ways. The three main way, the first of these is that a desire to, for the studies on Africa in particular, for, for experiences of knowledges in Africa, not always to be framed from the Western canon so that you're always understanding Africa as it's being explained to you by somebody else. The second, which is connected to that, is a recentering of African knowledge as, knowledge as part of their experiences of studying and understanding various parts of the African continent and the thematic questions uh, on the African continent. And we, at SOAS, for many of us who work on Africa and are from the African continent, when we talk about Africa, we're not talking about Sub-Saharan Africa, we're talking about Africa in its entirety. And the third, uh, this work, you know, so a, a sort of invocation around needing to see more black scholars, more African scholars as part of the experience. And that's why this program that I was talking to you about that, this, that students and staff collaboratively developed as part of reimagining what a, a program, a degree program on Africa could look like at SOAS was part of an emphasis on that. How do we bring the voices and sets of experiences that are sitting in different parts of the world to, to bear in how students interact and understand 
uh, studies on Africa. So that might be scholarship from the Caribbean, that might be scholarship from Brazil, you know, the general black diaspora in, a, in addition to scholarship from the African continent itself. Uh, Monica, let me start off with you for your final closing comments and then I'll go to Professor Zulu and uh, close out with Mira. Monica, are you there? If not, we can start off with Mira. Thank you, Awino. No, go ahead. Thank you, Awino. I would like to uh, reflect on what uh, what has posted uh, concerning uh, uh, the specific about what is good for the world that is good for Africa. And uh, in the paper, I have indicated how the Chinese, the Asian tigers, have taken advantage of global processes to indigenize uh, 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 global models that work for them uh, so that it could develop. Uh, as a matter of fact, globalization is a reality that each society, that, part of, that African humanity has to be part of it. So this is an inevitable path to cross. So there's, we, we need to just be proactive. Yes, there is a history uh, that bedeviled uh, uh, African civilization, but we, this, this is the reality. This is the order of the day. Globalization, advanced technology, informed by advanced technology and uh, communicative uh, channels is a, is a reality. You know, we, we need to transcend this historical trajectory and begin to be uh, uh, proactive about what is happening around us to better our lives as, uh, 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 as, as people, uh, uh, as part of humanity. So the African humanity need to embrace this new uh, phenomena and, uh, and, and begin to engage with them for their development and their interaction with the outside world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, Mira, I know you have to leave shortly. Um, so I think I would just close out by saying, um, I suppose what I'm saying is that decolonization should be understood as a practical project of liberation in which the origin of ideas can be important, but can't be the limit of our horizon for what we imagine when we think about liberation and engaging with um, projects that have understood liberation in a more multidimensional, um, more um, uh, guerrilla kind of creative way, I think helps us get out of that cage so that we're not always asking the first question is where does this idea come from instead of like, what are the purposes to which these ideas are put? And I think hopefully that can be a way to uh, negotiate our futures collectively. Thank you, Mira. Prof, your closing comments? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, as I say, I was very much impressed by Professor Achille Ngombo's conception of decolonialization this morning. What that led me to think was, is there a possibility which there should be of cascading these meanings and nuances much more lower than we are doing at present. For instance, much change is coming at the university is coming from the university to, from the student activists. But they come with a very narrow political agenda. As I'm saying, people never conceive, and I'll probably use my experiences in my own country. People never conceive of the elites in power as colonizing, literally. We can say they are corrupt. Some, a number of people do know that. But they have never literally gone to the roots of corruption. I'm not talking about the moral roots in this instance. I'm talking about the power configurations that if colonialism was an international project or a world project to say that literally, I'm running short of a word here, an appropriate word, that, 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 that in a sense polarized humankind 
into those who have and those who, who do not, in those who do, in those unto whom things are done. And if we are to develop curricula of liberation, we probably have to revisit the terminology because it can be very destructive. As it is now, a number of people were put off by the roads must fall. Thing because not only because of the practices, but because also if one subjected it to the intellectual language, it did not stand the test. And I'll be very brutal here. The statue of Rhodes must fall, but the buildings must not fall. What does one then think about that type of thinking? Oh, it's the politics of convenience. And these are things that I am saying we should try and attend to in, our, in the development of the intellect of our students. And some of these must start developments, must start at the undergraduate level. If at all we want to decolonize in the true sense of the word, the curriculum. I stop at that. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, Asanteni Sana for joining us today. I know that many are frustrated with the format of only being able to ask questions and you'd have wanted to have a much more robust uh, conversation and uh, particularly Prof, many would like to challenge you and I'm sure they will find you and challenge you on some of your arguments. Uh, <laughs> it's the nature of the format that's a bit limiting. Uh, I really just want to emphasize on my part in my closing remarks is to acknowledge that the ways in which we think about and approach questions of decolonization or from where I stand, the politics of knowledge production and the systems of power that are implicated in knowledge production are deeply connected to the, the way, in the, how we come into it, whether it's to family scholarship, political science, historians, seeking to look back at the past, seeking to focus on the present, seeking to use the contemporary moment as an opportunity to understand the global. So it's really different vantage points. I cannot underscore enough that the work of reorganizing how we think about ourselves, how we value up ourselves has to start from the, from the earliest point, from, from primary school. I see that in debates here in the UK around the curriculum, racism, structural racism and anti-blackness, and the fact that several times when students walk into my classroom, a postgraduate classroom, this is a master's classroom, they are telling me I'm the first black person to teach them that cannot be an okay thing because that also continues to send particular messages <coughs> about who knows are, who are the purveyors of knowledge are. And so the questions about inclusivity, diversity, and knowledge production processes are deeply interconnected. These are complex conversations, and I hope that we continue to have them. Of course, I'm going to plug the keynote that I'm chairing with uh, Desiree Lewis on African feminist knowledge production and decoloniality that's happening uh, tomorrow. Please sign up and join us for a much more expanded conversation of this. As Santeni Sana, sign up for the next panel and be well and take care.